Hello, everyone. Um, so today we are here to discuss about measuring and optimizing systems of value creation. Let's take the time to discuss a little bit about service delivery performance. My name is, is Marcia Sete. I'm from Australia. I'm a principal consultant at Elaborate. I've been working uh, for the last five years um, leading and, 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 and executing transformation initiatives across the most iconic Australian brands, which has been exposing me to a wide range of value streams, uh, operating model, organizational design and cultures. And today I want to take the opportunity to share a bit uh, some insights, um, and especially around the service delivery performance. So I want you to take this opportunity to reimagine service delivery performance and to do that before I think we need to look what is the current state, what is the state of play. So I tried to get like a few uh, points here to support us. The first one is that today uh, from, from where I stand, what I'm seeing is that performance is seen as an output measure of individuals and, and teams, like completely like inward looking, completely disassociated from value and disconnected from uh, customer needs. Another thing that I, that I see uh, commonly is that, that that strong belief that if you optimize the parts of the system, uh, we will produce an optimized whole, right? So trying to look, doing that local optimizations across different teams without concern to how that's affecting the overall system performance. The other thing is that we see commonly uh, teams and organizations uh, estimate in a deterministic way, things that are, uh, that are full of uncertainty and unknowns, and then really rely on their intuition and, and faith. Uh, the other thing I see strongly happening is that like this management paradigm, this established management paradigm focuses on resource efficiency. So we see organizations really trying to maximize the utilization of individuals, of specialists, of teams, of, of resources. And again, without concerns to how that's affecting the, the system as a whole. And also we see a lack of actionable performance data to support decision-making, to support like supporting the teams to shape new behaviors. And, and yeah, so this is like, I think it's a good summary of, of current state of delivery performance we see. So what I wanted to take, uh, do today with you is to take a moment to reimagine service delivery performance. How can we look uh, that from, from a different angle? And I would like to do that using like a few principles. The first one is about being customer centric. So performance must be seen from, from the customer perspective, shifting uh, the purpose of teams from executing tasks to satisfying customer needs. So from the moment that you, you shift that perspective, you stop discussing like performance from an internal perspective, how many story points can you deliver? Like what's your velocity? Like, like things that are in, internal uh, and, in, and you shift that perspective to the customer and then you start looking, what is my customer lead time? What is the predictability of, of, of that lead time? What is the quality I'm serving the, the, the customer? What is the predictability of that quality, etc.? cetera? Uh, just by doing this, this movement, this shift, like the purpose of the teams automatically shifts like it, it changes from just being uh, a, a, a group of people that are just like executing tasks without concerns to the big picture to being someone like a group of people that 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 is there to satisfy the customer needs so so i think the you should focus on on what matters most to your customer like things like the, their selection criteria criteria like things that that are important for them like universal selection criteria would be uh your lead time and the prediction 
amount of time, like your delivery rate, your throughput, how much can you deliver in a, in a period of time, and what's the predictability of that throughput, and what's the quality you can deliver, and what's the predictability of that quality. So I think uh, this help us to, to look performance from, from a different angle. And then I'm, I will bring some examples here to kind of pollinate the conversation, to bring food for thought. So what I want to do here is to show you uh, some, some uh, interesting things uh, you could do to do that. So imagine like your team are, are delivering like different services for your organization for like for whoever is your customer at the moment. So one example could be you're delivering like new product features or you're delivering fixes, enhancements and optimizations or hot fix, for instance. Let's say that's your service catalog, for instance. And then and what is the service level expectation? What what is what what your customer expects from you in terms of performance in that type of service? So let's say new product features, they would expect you to deliver new product features in 30 days or less, for instance, or fix and optimization 10 days or less, hot fixes one day or less. And in here, you could you could say, what is the predictability? What's your service level that you can, uh, what are the chances you can meet that expectation? So 76%, for instance, uh, in new product features that you can uh, uh, hit 30 days or less. So in 76% of the cases, you were able to satisfy the customer expectation of 30 days or less, 82% in fixed and optimizations, for instance, and hot fix. So if you're discussing SEF's level um, expectation and predictability, that needs to be towards a target. And the best target is the customer expectation, right? So another thing that's important is your your the predictability of your quality what's your defect rate uh on on that type of service when you're providing right um another way of looking is that uh when we look the 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 lead time distribution you could inform uh your customer look 55 days or less were required to complete 85 percent uh of new product features for instance so you're saying that that's the 85th percentile of my lead time distribution. Uh, so if you want if you want to have like a high level of certainty, you should probably consider uh, 55 days. Uh, if 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 you are comfortable dealing with uh, like uh, uh, a sales level of 76%, uh, like a confidence level of 76%, maybe then you can uh, consider 30 days. Another thing that that's important is when we look at uh, the delivery rate. And so imagine that's your like throughput per week, for instance. So you're measuring throughput per week. And then also on, on the horizontal line here, you can see what is the confidence level for your delivery rate. So there you're saying you have 85% of confidence that you can deliver at least eight product features or you have uh, confidence that you can deliver at least 17 product features per week or units of work per week, whatever it is. So I think that becomes really uh, useful and important um, when you're discussing, when you're kind of like working in a larger initiative that like you have that cross dependency, uh, that dependency across multiple teams working the same product, for instance, or even dependency cross products. Uh, and then you need to have a certain level of uh, certainty that you rely on that team to uh, do that bit so you can deliver your, your functionality. So you might need to have like a, a, a different class of service that will be either like a, a guaranteed or, or, or or standby or something so that like what is the minimal level that i can uh count on you to deliver and then i might uh get some of that capacity reserve that capacity uh for a specific week where i need you to do is uh, like one of the works that i depend on to deliver my uh, my my initiative or my work whatever it is um Cool. Another principle would be that contextual analysis. So sales delivery performance is extremely contextual. So for any data set to be meaningful, 
uh, your data needs to be filtered and aggregated. So if you're if you're looking at your data and then you're aggregating, putting everything in one basket and then try to extract insights from there, like really you're you're flying blindly. So for you to get any meaningful data when when you're looking at uh, service delivery performance, you need to you need to make that really contextual to that situation you want to extract insights. So it's really important to filter and aggregate your data. So like common uh, aggregations would be like either like a what's the portfolio level? You could be looking your data from a portfolio perspective, from a product perspective, um, from a team level perspective. So this is one way of, of, of slicing your, your data set and, and filtering. Another way is by looking for a specific, I want to look for a specific team or a specific service team. And I want to look for a specific type of demand and a specific class of service. And I might want to look in a specific period of time. So imagine that like all everything you see will change uh, in relation to the filters that you apply. So so here is an example where imagine like you are looking all these different perspectives of flow, and then you can be applying different filters uh, on the fly, and then the data that you are looking would be transforming in, in in relation responding to the filters that you're applying so imagine that you have the same output regardless the context that you apply but the data is, is changing so you can be looking your leads time distribution uh for one type of service and then you can specialize that lead time distribution for a specific class of service and then you can specialize that for uh one specific team etc so i think this is uh really important when you are dealing with your data another principle uh is thinking systems so visualizing measuring the interaction between the parts of your system will bring you far more insights than visualizing measuring individual outputs so it's really important to focus on, 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 on the interconnections of your system, understanding where are the handovers? Um, what are my, like, uh, uh, what are my pool, uh, pool rates uh, across uh, different stages of the workflow? How much, uh, how much queue I have between those handovers? How long are those queues for? And and you, you try to understand where the key source of the lay, where are the bottlenecks of the of your value stream of your process. Um, so we never know when when we're trying to use data as kind of like a, a debugging tool to understand how the system is performing, where are the, the, the biggest insights uh, that will, will drive you towards like finding the, the, like the, the, the most powerful interventions you can make on that system in order to improve performance, predictability and flow. We need to be able to look performance from different angles, from different perspectives. So you can't just look lead time, for instance. You can't just look your your flow efficiency for instance or or your quality or your the rate of your arrival and departure rates of your system etc you need to be able to look your system from completely different angles because we never know where the insights will come from right and then depending on the level and the context that you are like applying on your data like insights might come from like place that you 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 expect that the least so and 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 commonly that will not come just from one place that will come from the insights will come from a combination of different perspectives so you look wow my lead times is reducing my lead times reducing that that looks good but then you look your your quality the amount of of failure damage that you start getting like in that sky rocking so you know what I mean so you need to be looking your system from different perspectives and making sure that you're like contra looking like the different sides of the same coin so you, you, you make sure that 
you're not like a like lock optimizing for one perspective and then uh having like a undesired effect on on the system as a whole another another principle that is, is about shared consciousness um so if you really want to use data to improve performance predictability and flow it's really important to have like a shared understanding across across the organization or 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 or, or the level like the, the teams that are working um to satisfy the customer need i mean so like shared understanding about like how the system works how the work flows through the value stream they have that shared mental model they have a common language to discuss deliver performance and and given that we have this like that that helps teams to shape new collective behavior it could be understanding how the system is behaving and, and which type of interventions they need to make in a team level it could be defining new explicit policies it could be new pool transaction policies it could be redefining some whip limits and and um like applying uh new ways of 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 doing that replenishment meeting or, or whatever it could be uh but also enables the leadership to determine like what are the most impactful interventions they can make to improve that system of value creation? So I want to share like some like uh, insights like that I've been doing, and I think that might help as well for you. One is like how can you help create like that shared understanding and common language? And I think what has been working for me is just like it's it's about having conversation. It's about like a talking about that finding forums where you can talk about that it could be like you know just like hijacking one of the uh team retrospectives or it could be uh talking about that in a in a town hall or it could be hosting lunch and learns or it could be like a night talk or something if you are interested on on like getting people across creating awareness and desire to to know more and to be part of that to understand like a look performs from a different perspective like you should just get the message out there and and just by hosting conversations you'd be surprised by how many people would show up and listen to you and then the conversation would just start and like a positive spiral would take place and people would just start talking about it and, and and more and more people would get involved another thing that i that i found really useful to uh create awareness and and create that shared understanding of of what's happening is what i call the self's delivery performance baseline and i've been doing that with like a few organizations quite a few organizations here in australia uh in different industries so Imagine that you have your data right somewhere. Uh, it could be on Jira, Azure boards, Trello. It could be in an Excel spreadsheet, like whatever. Like imagine you take your data and you don't need much. Like really, you, what you need here is like start date and finish date. Uh, if if you have start date and finish date uh, for every unit of work, like it's impressive how much insights you can uh, you can extract just from that. So what you what you can do is is take your data run a quick analysis of of what is the lead time and then what is the lead time how the lead time distribution look like so you could find that like your lead time is varying from i don't know from one to 300 days you know what i mean but then you would ask yourself like how how that distribution from one to 300 days look like and then you could put together a, a quick histogram to understand what is the shape of that distribution and then look like a scatter plot to understand how that like a, a, a time the a time horizon view of how that that is taking place and i mean just trying to look your data not from a, a team perspective from an internal perspective but look from from your customer perspective what is the customer lead time? What's the predictability of that lead time? What is the quality, predictability of quality? What's the delivery rate? What's the uh, predictability of the delivery rate? Uh, what is the flow efficiency, etc.? So by doing that, let's say you take like 
a few hours and in, you do an exercise just using Excel, for instance, and you put a bunch of charts together uh, and then you play that back to your team. And then what I commonly see, like, are there a bunch of like aha moments happening? It, it seems that that's the first time they're exposed to their own data looking from the customer perspective. And, and that just triggers like a bunch of conversation. And, and like a, from, from, from that view, lots of questions start emerging. And, and, and this, is, this, is the, the, this is what is valuable here because this is not designed to bring you answers, that's designed to bring you questions. So by exposing your data to your team like, or, or to a team of teams, they will start looking at the data and then they start asking questions. Why, why is that the late time? Why is that the predictability level? What's happening? Why do we have that, uh, that, that SEPS level? Uh, how might we do this? How might we do that? Uh, and then just questions will start emerging. So this is a, a very good exercise and then that you can do quickly. And, and by setting the baseline, by like taking a dump of your data, playing with that, and then getting like some uh, metrics and analytics out of, out, out of that, you are setting a baseline where you can start using uh, for continuous improvement. So you can start using that to have data-driven continuous improvement. So you might, you might be asking like, what would happen if we would remove that queue from the system? What would happen if you would change the WIP limits in that stage of the workflow? What would happen if we would not have any more expedites and, and so on and so forth? And then you could then start measuring your, your future performance and comparing with the baseline to understand how much you are improving. Um, so the baseline is really good, but it has uh, a problem that, that's static, right? It's, it's a one-off, it's a, a dump, a snapshot. So you can't use the baseline for as a feedback loop mechanism to understand like, like I just changed, we just changed some behaviors here. How is that reflecting? You know what I mean? So, so it would be, would be great to have like live data. So every day in a rolling window, I could have insights from yesterday. You know what I mean? So today I'm bringing the yesterday data point to the data set and just cutting the first one over, over there. So. I've done a few uh, of those using different tools. Like this is an example of, uh, of Power BI. And we, we've done that in using Tableau and, and other different tools. So regardless of, of your output tool, like uh, you'd be surprised how, how quickly you can plug and play uh, these analytic tools to your to your data source to your jira to your azure board and then just play with the with the metrics and you'd be surprised so this is an example using uh power bi and then this is a different example where uh we will play with azure boards and uh consume the data from uh from the api and then just playing with visualization and and looking from different perspectives so connecting having a live view that you, you can have that dynamic analysis of your data uh, comes a long way to help build that shared understanding uh, and, and that shared mental model where everyone have the same information at the same time uh, and then they know what the information means and they know like how to use that to drive uh, continuous improvement. Another thing that helps a lot is to start hosting two of the um, Kanban uh, events, one called Ceph's Delivery Review and the other one called Operations Review. So on the Ceph's Delivery Review, that's really like on the team level, when you stop to reflect how your output is, is serving your customer. So you look again from, from your customer perspective and look like, 
the work that we are doing, how well are we serving our customer? Uh, how how satisfied is your uh, our customer with our uh, with our service level? How can we improve? Is is our lease time uh, good enough? Like is our quality good enough? Like how can we reduce uh, lease, the customer lease time? How can we increase uh, throughput rate, delivery rate? So that will be really looking from like a team, a system perspective, a service delivery perspective. And the operations review, we expand the scope uh, to a more broader view, have a more holistic view, where we bring different uh, services uh, that combined, they, they, they are serving like a, 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 a customer need. So let's say you have a value stream, which is made out of like a, a set of interconnected uh, services. Uh, and then that's the time where all those different services, they come together. And now instead of looking, how can we optimize ourselves? We are looking, how can we optimize the system as a whole? So we are discussing like, uh, like, where are the, the, the key source of delay in the value stream? Like where are the most problem, problematic handovers uh, across the stages of the workflow, across different teams or services? How can we improve that to, to have like a better end-to-end -end service? So those two um, ceremonies, they, they really help a lot to create uh, awareness, shared understanding, common language, and then to be everyone uh, focused on on satisfying the customer need, everyone walk walking towards the a common goal. Good. Um, the last one or the next one will be probabilistic forecast. So we see we see organizations having so so rich data sets uh, that they are not using uh, to provide any insights for the business, to help them forecast, to help them to like support decision-making, et cetera. So if, if you're working in any, any work item management tool, like you, you, you have lots of, of, of rich data you could use. Um, so one, one thing that we believe is that like teams should be leveraging their existing data and then using statistical and probabilistic approaches to forecast and stop having like that, um, you know, like deterministic approach to forecast, uh, to like doing estimation in a deterministic way uh, and then using uh, effort to estimate uh, in a deterministic way, and it's not looking elapsed time in a probabilistic way because that that's what actually matters for for your customer. So when we are talking about like probabilistic forecast, uh, a common method that we use is the Monte Carlo method. And when using the Monte Carlo method uh, with your data, it it help us to like among other things, answer two main questions. The, the, the first one is how many? So given that I have a period of time, how many work items is likely to get done? So let's say like your organization have like a, a, a fixed release date or you're working with safe and using like a product increments of, of three months, for instance. So so given you have like a start date and a finish date, so your question would be, how much work can I get done? And then, and we will do the forecast, but bringing the uh, probability together. So we would say you have 95% of confidence, like this one uh, real example, like uh, we did. Uh, so they had 95% of confidence. They could deliver 45 user stories in that example. 85% they could deliver 109 user stories and a 50% of confidence they could deliver 254 user stories. So as you see, as the amount of user stories increase, the likelihood decreases, right? 
So that's the probabilistic forecast. So we are not giving like one deterministic number. We are giving uh, ranges and then with probability associated with ranges. So the second question uh, the Monte Carlo can help us to answer is when. So given that I have this batch of work, it could be, I don't know, like a, a new epic on, on your product roadmap or, or something. Uh, when is that likely to get done? So here, let's say I have a batch of work that would have like 139 user stories, for instance. Given that we start on this date, when is likely that their work would be finished by? So 50% of confidence they would finish by 7th of June, 85% of confidence uh, that would be by September, 95% of chance would be by Feb uh, to the uh, next year. So here again, as, as the, the, the time uh, expands, now the likelihood increases, right? So if, if you have like a Jira board, if you have like an Azure board, if you have a Trello board, and then you have the date in which the cart was closed, just by having the date the cart was closed, you could benefit from your data to run probably forecasts like this. And then that's a, a way of visualizing uh, that, uh, that forecast uh, visually. So that's the, the how many questions. So we see the, the probability, the simulation will get like a, a range of results. And then we can see where the 50, 85th and 95th percentile sits on that distribution. And the same thing for when we ask when. So we have like a distribution and then we can see where those dates sit on, on that distribution. So really, uh, if, you have, if you have like work item data available, you should be leveraging that data and start playing with probabilistic forecast and leverage, just leverage your data. You, you get, uh, a much more accurate forecast in a fraction of the time that you use to uh, to do uh, estimations with your team. And that's the, the, the last bit. So that's about flow efficiency. Uh, the principle like is, well, we, we work in a knowledge work industry, right? And in, in the knowledge work industry, the most appropriate type of efficiency is the one in which customer value flows through a value stream to satisfy customer need. So we have two major types of efficiency, one being resource efficiency, where we are focused on maximizing the utilization of resources. And the second one is the flow efficiency, where we are focused on maximizing the utilization of the work. Like we don't want to keep people busy. We want to keep their work busy. So in the second one, we, we really focus on keeping the work busy and then making sure that the work is not idling queues. And we, we, we have that start and finish happening. Uh, so work coming in and out, in and out so that we have that system in a, in a state uh, of flow. So if you're not familiar with flow efficiency, so flow efficiency really looks like how much time, like value-added time you have dedicated to a unit of work across the, over the lead time, the total time. So imagine that we, we did a unit, like a piece of work. So we, have, we had a committed date here. And then we had a delivery date there. And then like within that elapsed time, like we, we had uh, some portion of the time we, we sit down and we were working and, and, and cracking the problem and, and, and satisfying that, uh, that demand. But uh, every now and then we got interrupted by something and then the work now was idling, was accumulating waiting time. And then we came back again, we did some more work. We were either blocked or, or we, we, we um, move to a different thing and then we came back and then we stopped again and eventually we finished the work, right? 
So let's say in, in this example here, let's say uh, we had a, a total leash time, a lapse time of 20 days. And let's say that we just actually worked on that card for four days. The rest of the time, the 16 days, the, the card was just waiting for testing, waiting for delivery, waiting for peer review, waiting for, you know, all the waiting columns we have uh, in, the, in the process. So in that case, 20% will be evaluated time, 80% would be waiting time. So this is your flow efficiency. So your flow efficiency in that case would be 20%, which means that 80% of the time the work was just waiting in someone's queue, in some team's queue. So the shocking reality here is that when we look across the board on average, like the work is idling queues for up like over 85 percent of the time and that's just shocking uh, so if leads if, if waiting time is expanding lead time is expanding if lead time is expanding like we have like a, a, a bag of problems that comes together with that so uh, by focus on on flow efficiency by focus on identify look in the value stream and understanding how much uh where are the key sources of delay how can we uh, tackle the source of delay, remove those delays, we can short the lead time, and then we can enable the, that system to start doing build measure learning cycles um, so that they can uh, learn more from, from their customer and then deliver better solutions. So if you look which are the big source of delay, uh, the top one is like your, your operating model design. Like, value streams that are designed to operate with several handovers, like uh, the product team upstream that goes to the architect team and that goes to the dev team, that goes to the QA team, that goes to the uh, release team. And then it goes, you know what I mean? Like that operating model design that, that's based on, on, on handovers where the deliverables of the previous one corresponds to a specialization of the process uh or where each stage uh, uh means a, a specialization of the process that's the biggest source of delay like across every handover you're going to have a queue and it's likely to be a long queue the second one are dependencies so if you're if you're not working at like your value stream your operating model is not designed around the customer it's likely that you're going to have that just web of dependencies across across individuals, across uh, teams within the same product, across products. So, so dependencies are the second biggest source of delay. Um, the third one is too much work in progress. So we just have like a too much work uh, and then we are pivoting across different uh, work all the time and like work are like receiving attention just a little bit, waiting for a long time, receiving attention for a little bit, waiting for a long time. The team liquidity, you know, like that, like super specialization. So I just do this type of work. He just do that type of work. She does just that type of work. So if you have highly specialized individuals or, or teams, uh, it's likely that uh, the, the, waiting time will increase manual and repetitive work is also like a big source of delay testing manual testing manual deployment like all, all everything that's high volume and repetitive that will cause delays and early commitment is also uh, another one when we start clocking the lead time we commit to a unit of work when we are not actually ready for that and their work is just idling and waiting the initial queue for a long time before starting. And the last one would be blockers. So when uh, something that's like we are not in control. So if you look the like the the, the top seven uh, source of delay, um, you can see that the top six are by design. Are something that that you are in control of. Like you can change. You, by design, you can evolve your system through evolutionary changes to uh, improve it, right? So, yeah, so just to finish, uh, I wanted to share like a repeatable pattern that has been working uh, for me and in a case study as well, uh, when we are 
helping different organizations here in Australia. So the first thing, as I said on the beginning, was like just create awareness, like uh, try to create awareness and interest in, on different ways of measuring and, and looking your system, right? So it could, as I said, it could be from many different ways. It could be via talks and could be um, uh, like just having conversations uh, with like a P2P and, and small teams and larger teams. And then doing the, the self delivery performance baseline, when you get your data, you do some analysis, you extract some metrics and analytics looking from the customer perspective, and you share that information that causes a lot of like a uh, positive traction and energy uh, in the teams. I've seen that. And then you might want to like walk your value stream and try to understand why the system is behaving the way it is behaving. So you, want, you might want to add like a narrative uh, on back on the data to support like your your numbers so well we have that late time and that's the likely cause and that's why we have delays here and there you know you, you try to map your like the current way of working to to the data so you have that narrative happening and then once like the momentum is growing you might find a way of having that dynamic analysis so you have like on-demand metrics like connected to your data source like there are multiple ways of doing that you have like a bunch of very good SaaS tools on the market today uh, that that you can plug and play get your metrics or if, if you like uh, playing with numbers like just use like Google Sheets Excel uh, you could also plug that in a Power BI in a Tableau or something like it, it's not hard to um, to get like live data uh, and then use that as a, as a continuous feedback loop mechanism. And then once you get it, you might want to have like a, someone playing the role of a service delivery manager, someone that's really focused on the service delivery aspect of, of that value stream. Like how well are we serving the customer? Uh, like what's our service level? How can we improve our service level, etc. So, and then you might start hosting like or meetings, events like operations review, service delivery review, to increase uh, uh, awareness and, and find where are the most uh, appropriate place you can make interventions and run evolutionary changes. So that's a repeatable pattern that that's working quite well for us here in Australia. And like I just wanted to share one case study, uh, which was in a one. Uh, neo banking in Australia in, uh, in their digital division. So we we did the baseline to understand how they were performing, and then we we got some insights uh, to what was causing that that system behavior. And then we just start doing the journey. We said, and then after twenty six weeks, that's the we went back to measure again, and that's the result we got. So they managed to reduce leash time up to sixty nine percent. That's that's just impressive uh the predictability level had increased like to uh, 54 percentage points which is also like massive the value demand improved from 31 to 65 percent and the failure demand reduced from 69 to 35 percent so if you look they pretty much shift the rate the ratio of value demand and failure demand in in just 26 weeks so that's like six months pretty much right so their whip age has reduced like 61 percent and their whip also reduced 86 percent which helped them to bring uh, the amount of whip in the system to a sustainable uh level so again just by looking your data, observing your data from your customer perspective, having your data there as a feedback loop mechanism and creating awareness and, and, and shared understanding uh, across your organization, that's the sort of, of results you can get in such a short period of time. So to finalize what I want you to remember, uh, I think like those six principles uh, could be a good food for thought uh, and could be a good conversation started 
for your team, for your organization, for your value stream. So in the next retrospective, you might want to bring like some of these and then talk about that. And then that might be the starting point of, of your journey. So remember to look your delivery performance from your customer perspective. Remember like your data is only meaningful if, if it is contextual. Remember to do different initiatives to create shared consciousness uh, across your organization. Thinking systems, not in, in elements. So focus on more on the interconnection, on the interaction between the elements of the system instead of the output of the uh, individual parts of your system. Try to leverage your, your data and, and use that to run probabilistic forecasts. And then if you need to focus on uh, efficiency, uh, please, in knowledge work, choose to focus on, on flow efficiency. And, and, and that's my message to you today. And thank you very much. Uh, those are my contacts. And feel free to reach out and keep the conversation uh, going. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Marcio, for a great talk on service delivery. Um, how are you doing? Yeah, very good. Hey, hey Todd. Yeah. Hey there. Good to see you. <laughs> yes, you didn't have to travel this time. But... Yeah, that was good. <laughs> That's good. All right, we've got several great questions for you. Um, we'll start off with one. So this is it towards the end. You mentioned you know the with flow efficiency and some of the main causes and the causes being related to the design of the system. Uh, well, so one of the things is how do you reduce the several handovers of a piece of work in order to reduce delays? I think I think like the first thing is is try to, to first thing is try to visualize the delays because most of the time delays are hidden today in your system, so you don't know where the key source of delay of your of your systems are. So if if you're able to visualize delays today. And then understand well, like 20% of my leave time is just on this uh, ready to test column or ready to deliver column or something. So if you if you are able to, to visualize and point where are the key source of delay in your system, then like that will be just a natural step for people to start asking how might we questions. And they will ask, how might we remove this queue? How might we uh, do a better integration between dev and test. How can we shift quality left? And how, you know what I mean? So those questions, they will just pop up and then the teams will, will figure out a way of, of addressing that. And the solution will be really contextual to like every team. But the, the most important uh, thing is to make the information uh, visible, explicit, so that people can talk about it and do something about it. All right, great, great. Um, okay, with regards to some of the performance metrics for an organization that's that's collecting little to no metrics today, what would be your guidance to start? You know, taking on too much is likely overwhelming and overreaching. So, where, where's what's sort of the getting started with metrics uh, perspective? What would you... Yeah, unfortunately, we we hear a lot of these like uh like we can't do metrics because we don't have uh, uh, like a good quality data. Like that, that's a, a common excuse across the board. So really, if, if you can only measure one thing, try to measure your finish date. If you can measure your finish date, just the finish date, then you can have a, a notion of delivery rate. You understand how much work you can complete per unit of time. It could be, uh, on a weekly basis, on a fortnightly basis, on, on a uh, monthly basis, etc. And then by having that delivery rate, you are able to run forecasts of how much you can deliver in the future. Uh, so if you can measure two things, then measure finish date and start date. So if you have start and finish date, now you have a notion of duration. You, you can have a notion of, of lead time, how long the work is taking to complete. And then every unit of work will have its own lead time, its own elapsed time that took to go from commitment to delivery. And then because you have a uh, lead time for every data point, then you start having like a distribution and you can understand how long it takes to complete 
the work in 85% of the time, in 95% of the time. So you can get a notion of, of time to market, of response time, and then you can understand your level of predictability in relation to your customer service level expectation. And then you might figure out that, wow, we are not fit for our customer purpose. And then again, if that's the case, the question would, would emerge on how might we do something to become fit for our customer uh, purpose for, for their expectation. And then as soon as you have that information, as soon as you have a target, you have a, a, a like a purpose to do, and then the teams will figure out a way of becoming more efficient and of producing lead time. And most of the time, the lead time is composed by waiting time. So it's not about like a finding a way of, of coding faster, of testing faster. It, it's about removing the lay from the system so you can shrink your lease time and become more fit for your customer purpose, if that makes sense. No, excellent. That's great. Great, great place to start. Um, so I think we have some people envying some of your charts in the in the presentation. So they're asking, are the charts in the slide performance data science? That's that's one of your earlier ones. You had a, a, a matrix of, of uh, different charts. They're asking if they're generated automatically and by what software. So maybe just talk about software tools a little bit about which ones you're using and how do you automate it? How do you how do you make collection of metrics to be not too much overhead? And yeah. So um, so I think today there is no excuse for not being like uh, using data to guide like your your like your delivery function, right? So you have like heaps of excellent tools on the market that you can just plug and play. So, and then also you can, like if, if you don't want to use like a, a, a vendor to doing that, like you could just play yourself with the data. So uh, on that case, we were doing, uh, connecting uh, the data source, like the work item management tool with Power BI. That was one example, but you could connect that with your Excel, you with your Google Sheets, with your Power BI, with your Tableau, and then just read your 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 work items from your tool and then understanding what's your start date, your finish date, and then other things you might be interested on and then start playing with that. So you'd find heaps of content available for you to understand what are the key things you need to look. Your uh, your lead time, your week, your throughput, those are your king metrics, right? The things, your actionable metrics. So uh, just lead time, throughput, and week. Just with that, you can do like lots of things. And then if, if you can expand that to start looking, your flow efficiency, your arrival and departure rates, etc., you can go there. But just looking lead time, week, and throughput, you're going to get enough insights to understand how your system is operating and how to make intervention, the necessary interventions to like improve your system. And then again, you find heaps of content available uh, uh, for you to understand how to do the calculations, how to create a chart. That's not a big deal. All right, great, great. Uh, here's a good question, I think. Um, you talked a lot about delivery metrics. Uh, is there a danger that by focusing on these that you risk the team dropping other things such as quality, et cetera? Do you do anything to balance the metrics to avoid teams gaming the system? So you have a, a balancing yeah. mechanism to make sure that you're, yeah. Uh, that, that's ahead. a that's a very good question. Uh, so that that's what we we call the systems thinking. That was the principle about systems thinking that I mentioned. So when you're looking delivery performance, you cannot only look one perspective. You need to be able to look. Uh, your system from different angles, from different perspectives. So as you said, if you only look uh, leech time, for instance, then you might you might get your leech time, you might see your leech time reducing, but you might be your your uh, uh, failure rate like increasing a lot, or you might see other uh, undesirable effects happening in your system. So you need to be able to look your systems your system from different perspectives. Look your lead time, but look your whip, look your uh, throughput, your flow efficiency, your arrival and departure rates, like the, the ratio of uh, planned and unplanned work, etc. So there are a lot of things you might you might look. And then depending on 
if you're looking on a team level, on a team of teams level, or in a portfolio level, it's likely that the insights you need will come from different places or will come from a combination of different places. So you never know where the insights will come from. So that's why it's important to look from different perspectives. And as soon as you have either created your charts that you can like a refresh, uh, your data and have like a live data, you are using a, like a, 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 a tool available in the market that you can plug and play. Um, you you have that data available and then you can start looking on a daily basis and understanding if you, if the change that, that you are making, like your assumptions about your system is holding true. So like if the intervention is actually helping you to reduce uh, uh, lead time, increase predictability, increase quality, increase delivery rate, etc. All right, great, great. Um, here's, here's, a, I think, a pretty good question here. To, first, those uh, great presentation, thank you. Um, please tell some real world example of such data analysis that resulted in a decision that was not obvious without the data analysis. So you showed us in the case study how you went from, you know, how you changed the metrics but from a decision, how did that? How did the, the the metrics themselves help guide you in that path? How did you did you do do things that wouldn't have been obvious um, without having the the data to guide you? Yeah, that that's a very good question. Um, like, if 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 you are being data driven, you would probably have uh, data available in three buckets. One is about completed work like everything that you have completed so far. The other bucket will be the work that's in progress and the other bucket will be the work to be done in your inventory, right? So from these three buckets, the one that will probably be uh, most effective uh, on helping improve um, you know, like how your performance, your efficiency will be the bucket where you see your work in progress, where you can see the amount of whip you have, uh, you can see the whip, the age of the whip, you can see the whip getting old every day, and then you can see, wow, like this work here is hitting like uh, the fifth percentile of my lead time, is hitting the 75% of my lead time, and then that might drive different decisions in the team. They might be uh, expediting things, they might be uh, changing like a uh, some pool policies or, or something they might make different uh decisions on a replenishment meeting etc so i think when you look like you have real time data about your whip that really helps shape the team's behavior but most more important than that i think is just the consciousness about flow uh, as soon as your team become aware of of flow, become aware of customer lead time, of sales level expectation, and they have like some, some feedback loop mechanism where can, they can see like where I should be, where I am, and what I need to do to get it where I should be. Just by become aware and, and, and have like that shared consciousness about like we are uh, uh, favoring uh, flow efficiency over resource efficiency. We are aiming to hit that sales level expectation with their quality etc so i think that's the most important thing that changed the game and then like it's a it's a completely different system it's a completely different way of working way of behaving the team shifts from from executing tasks to satisfy a customer need to be aware from the customer to pay attention to the customer and and that changes everything i guess that's my experience <laughs> No, great. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for a great presentation and excellent um, responses. Appreciate it. Beautiful. Thanks. Beautiful.